of uh, Q and A in quarantine. Uh, my name is Chris Marr. We got Jeremy Bernstein here. Um, if you have missed any of ours, um, you can go to our Facebook page and click on videos, and they're all archived there. Um, we've done one. We've done them on vinyl mastering, General Studio Tour, uh, Studio Tech. We did one on Mar Machines itself, um, and then we've got three or four rolling around with um, me and artists that we work with and their producer, kind of talking about the artist producer engineer relationship, which is really interesting because it's a different one each time. Uh, we got one in a couple of days with an uh, artist from Australia, Jack Nolan, and uh, producer Justin Weaver. So that'd be fun. But today we're talking about tape transfers, which is a big part of what we do and love at Welcome to 1979. Um, I've got uh, Jeremy, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Hey everyone, uh, my name is Jeremy Bernstein. I'm a staff engineer at Welcome to 1979. And I also do a lot of the um, tape transfer archival work. Um, it's more than just tape transfers, but mostly tape transfers. And uh, I've been working there for about a year and a half. Cool, yeah, and you engineer sessions and, and head up the archive stuff, which is great. Um, and my name is Chris Marr. I'm one of the owners of Welcome to 1979. Um, and I engineer sessions there and coordinate with Jeremy on pretty much everything we work on. Um, so a quick little history about um, tape transfers at Welcome to 1979. Obviously, the name Welcome to 1979 is an analog-focused recording studio. And and quite by accident, we, we stumbled into a lot of tape transfers early on. People were, there wasn't anything we've ever really advertised the first couple of years, but people just said, hey, you've got tape machines, you must do this, and quickly got to speed on all things tape. And I had worked with a lot of tape in the past and done transfers at different studios and this and that. So I had a good working knowledge of that. And then just getting handed these big projects week after week and handling all these different tapes. We had this huge uh, amount of knowledge oh, wow. on, on not only recording on tape, but archiving tape. And it's become one of my favorite things to be a part of history. And we take it really serious to be to be entrusted in, in not only large projects, which we'll talk about, but more personal ones that, that family members have and, and remembrances of, of people that have left us or are leaving us and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then being able to couple with Mara machines and having not just tape machines, but perfectly restored tape machines and all the different formats and that knowledge, it, it's, it's a really strong team. And, and we lean on kind of everyone, don't we, Jeremy, when we get these bigger projects in. Totally. You know? Yeah. Because um, we'll, we will build machines specifically for a project, you know? Um, well, now that I've kind of brought us up to speed and ranted a little bit, because I can do that, um, Jeremy, what, what is tape archiving to you? What, what is, you know, what, what is, what is it? just in case people are, are asking what we're talking about. Transferring sure. to what, right? So when we're talking about our archiving work and tape transfers, we're talking about transferring any physical medium, typically tapes, from an analog, tangible source, you can hold it in your hands, to a digital, a clean transfer to digital, as true to the original source as possible. So. We also do vinyl transfers, record transfers. We do cassette transfers. Um, tape transfers is probably the one we do the most, definitely the one we do the most. But the real reason for doing this is that whenever you have something tangible, something you can hold, a reel of tape, a cassette, you know if you had a cassette, it, it will break, it can break, it yeah. will break. It's, it's just a matter of when, not if, with tangible sources, they have an expiry date, an expiry, expiry date. So it's our job to save it, basically, give it um, a stable, long-term storage solution. And digital is what that is for us, because it's really easy to make copies. You can back up, make copies of a source in a matter of minutes. And that's not something that is offered as easily or as realistic in today's day with an analog source. OK, so, so you mentioned it, it, you're transferring a tape to digital, so the end product is what? Like, if I bought you a 24 track 
two inch tape, what would I get and why? If you brought me a 24 track two inch tape, we would give you back uh, your wave files at whatever specifications you want. So we'll send you back digital files for individual tracks if it's a multi-track transfer. So an eight track, a four track, 24 track, whatever it is, if it's multi-track, you'll get individual files. You'll get your bass amp track and your bass DI and your overhead left, your overhead right. You'll get them all individual. As long, uh, you also get a Pro Tools session because that's the DAW that we're working in, but it doesn't mean that you need to work in Pro Tools. You're gonna get your individual audio files. You can import them into whatever software you're using. So it's Logic, Pro Tools, whatever. Um, whereas if we get a stereo two track transfer, um, a mix or master, um, then you'll get a interleaved stereo transfer. That's, you'll get the wave file back interleaved. And that way you can play it and import it into iTunes or back it up to your software, get it remastered, do whatever you're trying to do with it. Okay. So, and then why, why do you think people transfer like multi-track tapes and stuff? I understand that the, the mixes they want to, you know, remaster it and put it on Spotify, something that hasn't been on Spotify or something like that. But why the multi-track tapes? Why, why do they do that? There's a few reasons you might do that. One is not all projects that get recorded onto a reel of tape make it to release. Um, sometimes we are doing transfers for projects that have never been commercially released. So in that case, I mean, I guess in either case, I mean, you would do the multi-track transfer most likely to remix it, totally do a remix of it. But we sometimes have people who end up doing these transfers from the 90s and end up overdubbing onto it uh, I think that's probably a more likely solution for something that hasn't been released, but it's not uncommon. All the time people will tell me, we're going to cut a new vocal on this and release it. But um, when you're doing the multi-track transfers, we're not giving you back a mix. We're giving you back right. the stems, basically, the, the multi-tracks broken out. Just as if you were to record it in digital. Again. Yeah, and you're right. People, people want to remix it with new technology. They want to pick up where they left off on something. Um, we transferred something last year for someone who's 90 years old and they wanted to keep doing some overdubs on it. And I think it's awesome. That's something that was recorded in the early eighties is still viable. You know, yeah. man, we've got a ton of questions already. So um, let's, let's look at a couple real quick and there's a couple we'll get to in a second. Okay. So here's one, Jeremy, you can take it from Tara. She wants to know what's the sample rate bit depth we capture for masters. Um, so the, the house standard for those specifications that welcome to 1979 are 24 bit, 96 kilohertz. However, when we're doing a tape transfer, um, you're the client. So whatever, we have a transfer release form that you have to sign before we can start actually working on your tapes. Um, just giving us permission to work on your tapes and also giving us any information that would be helpful for our transfer. If you know the tape speed, um, if you know how many songs are on there, which isn't always accurate, but it's just useful info. Some of the info on there is desired bit rate, bit rate and sample, um, bit depth and sample rate. So we'll do yeah. it, whatever. Some people want it at 24, 44, one. Some people want it 32, 96. We'll do whatever you ask. Yeah, we can do up to 192. Um, like like Jeremy said, our standard is 96K 24-bit. And if someone doesn't know what they want, we do that. And then we'll downsample from there. We always want to capture it high, uh, high as we can. Um, Hugh Lister wants to know what the average cost for transfer is. Um, and then his follow-up question was including baking, which we'll get into. Mm -hmm. um, our prices that Jeremy will talk about uh, include restoration and baking. Um, we do a lot of that. Go ahead. What's our, what's our average price? It's really project dependent. I, I wish I had a, a number for you, but it really depends. Some clients come to us with one reel of stereo transfers and some clients come to us with 20 reels of multi-track transfers. So it really, it really just depends on how many, um, how much material, how much um, tape you're going to bring to us. Um, our yeah. prices are all include baking. Um, so that's part of the process for us. We sometimes people will bring us tapes and say, we've already baked this and great. That's cool. Um, but our price is the same for transferring. We, we include baking in our costs. 
And for stereo transfers, the cost is $25 a song with a three song minimum per reel, which includes bacon. And for multi-track transfers, the price is $50 a song with a three song minimum per reel as well. Yeah. So like Houston wanted to know about a one song, 16 track, that would be a $50 a song, we probably have a minimum just because it still takes us as long to prepare the tape, evaluate it, bake it as it does one song versus three. So we kind of have a minimum, not so much song rate, but a dollar amount. And then Joshua wants to know, um, do we have a bulk discount for tape libraries? Yes, we do. And we'll get into that because this is a great segue. We have like three different types of transfers we do, right, Jeremy? Yeah. Uh, I'm going to lay them out and we'll talk about each one. Okay. Sure. Cool. Um, and and Joshua also want to know what a tape needs restoration. And this is where we're experts at this. We can look at a tape and tell you if the track sheet's wrong based on the tape formulation if, because we get a lot of poor documentation, which Jeremy will get into later. Yeah. But the three, the three basic transfer types we get are what we call heirloom transfers, which are um, not for commercial use. It's families that have anything. I'm going to dig up some pictures as I talk. Anything from from a cassette, a micro cassettes from their parents talking to um, to these letters from home. These little little tapes that people traded back and forth during wartime. Um, to uh, little vinyl records that people made, um, you know, and, and and we'll get into this too. I could tell you a lot of really cool stuff, but we, we did a lot of archives for um, uh, actually an artist we work with on the studio side. Her father was, was kind of very ill and the family wanted things to remember him by as, as his final days approached and we transferred a bunch of his dictation notes from when he was uh, a doctor, you know, so that, the reason I mention all that is those fall under a completely different price point. We, we do those, we do the letters from home for free yeah. because that's our duty, I feel, as, as historians. And that's, and it's such a family connection. And we've got a good story about that later. Uh, and then we do the smaller transfers like the last was asking about, you know, one song, uh, two or three reels, like a project for commercial use. And that's what Jeremy was talking about, $25 a song for stereo files, $50 a song for multi-tracks. And then we do these large archiving projects. So why don't we talk about those? Because that that's, you know, that's where all these questions can get answered, right? Sure. So yeah, talk about the restoration, the documentation that we do, the documentation that comes to us, what what these because if we can talk about how we do like a big library, then people will know how well we'll treat their small projects. Sure, yeah, that makes sense. So last, I'll use, uh, we had a project this last summer, fall, um, that I'll use as an example for this. We had a producer from LA, who did most of his work in LA, who now lives in Nashville, brought us 370 tapes, set 370 reels of tape, and they were, totally various stuff. Half, about half of them were two inch tapes. The other half were quarter inch. There were a few half inch thrown in there. A lot of different formats, some 16 tracks and 24 track. So our first order of business when we get tapes for a large project or a small project is we want to keep track of the tapes. It's one of, it's one of the most important parts of the process, if not the most important part is keeping track of the tape making sure it doesn't get mixed up when we have when we're working on multiple projects it's imperative that we keep track of everything so we developed our own um, in-house naming convention for our tapes that give whoever's working on the transfer all the relevant info that they would need so the client is included in our code um, the track count is included in our code the tape width is included in our code and a unique real identifier is included in our code. So this way, when I'm working with a team on a transfer for those big projects, there's a team of us, it's not all we need um, for speed and efficiency. For these large projects, I can say, hey, like who did reel 67? Like what was up with that reel? And I can ask questions. A lot of times the tapes that we get come with documentation, but documentation is not always accurate. I've 
been disappointed sometimes. Um, yeah. You do enough transfers and you realize sometimes people will come to us and say, I have some 24 track tape for you. And they'll come with five reels and none of them are 24 track tape. It's all 16 track. And sometimes a track sheet will say that there's audio on there. There's something on track 10. There's nothing on track 10. There's, I mean, sometimes the documentation is wrong, but it's always nice when there is documentation provided. It can make my job easier. Yeah, but you can just see even the pictures I'm showing there, the documentation is pretty sketchy just because they were in the moment. You totally. know? Absolutely. So what we found is if we put a we put a sticker on the reel itself, like the gold reel there, and one on the box, and that number is the Pro Tool session number. Thank you, Jeremy. Yeah. So you can look at your reel and look at the the Pro Tool session and have a lot more information at your fingertips. You know. Yep. Um, quick, we got a quick question. Johnny wants to know: Are you equipped to handle two inch twenty four track with uh, Dolby A, which is a great question, and then uh, a track half inch with DBX. So go for it, Jeremy. How do we handle those two formats? So yes, we are capable of doing half inch eight track transfers, DBX encoded. Um, and yes, we're equipped to do twenty four track two inch tape. Um, the Dolby A encoded, we do lots of transfers that are encoded with tape with a Dolby A or B. And we do have some Dolby A and Dolby B noise reduction units in the studio. A lot of the times we find that it's really a non-issue um, when transferring a Dolby encoded reel. Sometimes when it is apparent that it's been encoded, it's a fix that can be, it's something that can be fixed with modern solutions, plugins. There are now Dolby, um, both A and B emulation plugins, which work and can do these services. Or you could spend the time to bounce through Dolby hardware units. We have two Dolby A units at the studio. So it would be an additional charge for us to basically bounce your tracks through the Dolby A units, but we are capable of doing it. But I would yeah. say that often enough, we do, we'll do the transfer flat without the, without um, decoding the Dolby and it's not an issue. It's not really apparent. Yeah. Cause most of the time, well, fundamentally we want to capture the tape just straight into a DAW, right? Because noise reduction units, the, the documentation could not indicate what type of noise reduction yeah. or noise reduction units um, need to be calibrated. So we, we want a, a transfer without all that because we want to just get the tape ready to transfer and, and get a pristine transfer. And then once it's in Pro Tools, you can come back in and out and sort things out or like Jeremy mentioned, use a plugin and just toggle through. But we've done a lot of them where they were encoded and it sounded really good without the decoding um, either we think well maybe the engineer didn't use it on the vocal and didn't document it or whatever you know back in the day so that's our process but to answer your question johnny we can do any professional format and we have a few of the of the prosumer ones like half and j track but if it's a professional format the answer is yes um well a couple of people jeremy have asked about baking sure so what is it, when do you do it, and why? So when we're talking about baking for tapes, it's obviously a very different type of baking than your baking banana bread. It's yeah. a much lower temperature, um, and the real goal of it is to pull moisture out from the tape. So over decades of sitting tightly packed, a reel of tape is going to start to stick and adhere to itself. I mean, it's tape, tape sticks. Think of it just like any other tape, scotch tape, whatever, think about it like that. It's packed tightly and over time, it's gonna start to adhere and bond to itself. So by baking the tape, you're pulling some of that moisture out. And this is essential for most transfers that I do, especially the high output tapes of the 80s, 90s, but even tapes from the 70s and 60s, it's still usually necessary and provides a smoother, more effective transfer. Um, so when I'm doing a tape transfer, there's really two things, two, it's kind of a balancing act of two sides of the equation that are equally important. I've got the audio side 
and then I've got the mechanical, tangible side. And when we're baking a tape, it really is affecting the mechanical operation. If I don't bake a tape, it might start to shed and it might start to gunk up my dancer arm on the tape machine or the actual um, heads, the erase head will often get really gunked up. Really, yeah, that's a really bad example. That's a tape that needs to be baked longer. Um, that's a tape that needs to be baked way longer. Yeah, there's, you can see the oxide building up on the tape heads. That's going to cause dropouts on my audio. It's going to cause high speed, um, high frequency information to roll off dra like dramatically, like nothing above 4K type of deal. Like really, it can be really dramatic and apparent. But also, it will more likely wear out here at first. In my experience, is on the mechanical side. It will it will gunk up a capstan or a dancer arm and cake up on it so much that the machine won't be pulling at the speed it should be pulling at anymore. So if it's a 30 inch transfer and my tape heads look like that and everything is gunked up like that, the friction is going to slow the machine down, sometimes to the point that the machine stops in the middle of a transfer. That has happened. So by baking the tapes, you're pulling the moisture out. And by doing that, you're going to get less of that shed and less of the oxide caking up mechanical transport of the machine. Okay. So what you're saying is if I just grab the tape that someone dropped off, put it on the machine, hit rewind, and hit play, several things would happen that are bad. One, the transfer itself would not be ideal because it could affect the speed and high frequency of the, the playback. Yep. And maybe and, the full audio, if it's a, if it's a quarter inch two track, it's probably going to be a dropout, a full on right. a dropout. You might lose your left side for a second. Okay. And then I'm damaging the tape because that stuff is not going to come back on, right? Once it's once material falls off the tape, once the oxide is falling off the tape, the oxide is where the the particles are being recorded. It's where the recording is your media. So yep. when you are losing anything, when I see oxide falling onto my deck plate, I stop. If I can, it depends. It's it's a balancing act because. It depends where on the machine it's falling off. If I'm at the very top of my reel and I press play and I start to see shed, I stop immediately because yeah. I can save it still. If, I'm, if I've got 30 seconds left on my reel, a minute left on my reel, and I start to see shed, I let it roll because I don't want to lose what I've done. So it's a balancing act and you got to know when, when to stop and when to let it roll because for instance, it also matters where on the machine the shed is happening. If I'm shedding before my tape head, like at my dancer arm, if I'm seeing cinnamon sticks of oxide come off, just flakes of brown oxide come off at my dancer arm, which is before all of my tape heads, I stop because that's I'm losing my material before it gets to my transfer. Yeah. Sometimes I'll see some ox some shedding happen uh, after the tape heads, and in that case, it's less of an issue because. Yes, this sucks. My tape is falling apart. However, it's happening after I'm transferring to digital. And at the end of the day, most of our clients don't want the tape afterward. I mean, they get it back, obviously, but what they want is they want the files safely transferred to digital. Yeah. Well, and Nick, uh, right here, who actually has done a bunch of transfers with us, yeah, has yeah. Me. Um, I don't want to go into everything about what he's asking about because we, we have developed a, a proprietary system, but yeah. kind of, it kind of lends to why our rates are what they are is because there's a lot of preparation to the tapes before they even get put through all the rollers on a machine, right? Yep. Um, so, so what Nick is talking about is we have a way that we kind of evaluate and get the tape moving a little bit, and it, it, it results in two things. We can get an idea of how long to bake it for based on, on a bunch of factors. And it kind of brings the tape back to life without damaging it. So, um, and it's a really great question. question. I mean, sometimes we do baking in steps, if that makes sense. Sometimes yeah. we've got, a, we've got multiple steps that we take. That's all part of our tape evaluation process that we take before we ever get ready to actually do the transfer. And that's all of these steps are to better inform me as to what I'm dealing with, so I can identify it. This is gonna be a problem reel. This reel needs to be baked extra long, or this 
tape is just in bad shape. So it's just good to know. It's always the more information I can have before I'm actually doing the transfer, the better. Because a lot of times you get one shot with a transfer. You get one shot to really get it right. And that's not saying that I can't, I couldn't try it again after. Um, you work with what you got. Some tapes I get here have visible water damage. The box is water, it has water marks all over it. And I know, okay, this tape's in rough shape. And there's only so much you can do. I mean, sometimes you're, you're, you you got to work with what you're given. So yeah. these steps help me identify before it's kind of make or break time what I'm dealing with and what challenges I might be facing. Yeah, and, and Johnny's got a good question here too. Have you found that certain brands of tape have more are more prone to shedding? Absolutely. Sticking? So Absolutely. I put out this photo of, you know, five reels of tape and you know, Jeremy and I can both look at that and tell you that the, the two on the left are Ampex 456. They're, they're going to require a lot of work. Um, I mean, a couple rounds of baking and exercising. The middle reel there, that's a, a mid-70s um, 3M, it looks like, reel. That one, will, that one will require some baking, but not nearly as long. And the Bassett ones are older Bassett ones. They're kind of in the same category as 3M. So it's just all this knowledge that we've gained over the years saying, okay, you know, let's start with the, with the 456s because they're going to require the most preparation and, and be a complete pain. And then, then as those are baking, then we'll look at the other ones and then the whole project will kind of be ready for transfers at the same time. And so to answer your question a little, a little um, more specifically, for me, it's like on one end of the spectrum, you've got Ampex 456. That is for me, it's the bane of my existence. It's sticky. It's the stickiest formulation that we work with. Honestly, it's the tape formulation that I have worked with the most. So I'm really yeah. familiar with it. It was really popular and it sounds great. It's a great sounding formulation, but to work with in a tape transfer environment, it's a nightmare. It's so sticky, but at the same time, I'm really comfortable working with it. I because I've done it so many times, I know I'm dealing with the devil. Um, yeah. so you yeah. don't just put it on and have a and have a problem. And go, what's going on here? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. yeah. And then on the other side of the spectrum, for me, again, this is just my experience, is the Scotch tape. Scotch for a transfer is a dream to work with. In my mind, it's so much easier. It's more forgiving. I have it shed on me way less. It's much less sticky. Um, but yeah, I mean, we're, we're, we are familiar enough with all of the different formulations that were commonly used that we know, I know I have a ballpark of how long I'm going to have to bake a tape within 30 seconds of my tape evaluation. I can tell pretty quickly where I'm at. And, and why, I mean, <laughs> so how many reels have you transferred? Cause you know, I wouldn't trust you with my tape just looking at you. Somebody said you look like, um, who did they say you look like? Ringo. You know what I mean? <laughs> oh, man. Well, I, don't I, all of that, okay. I guess I'll take it. Um, so uh, how, many, how many tapes have you transferred, Jeremy? I would say that I myself have transferred over 600 tapes. Um, and I would say that as part of a team that I've worked with, we've transferred well over 1,000. But myself alone, I would say probably about 600, somewhere in, in yeah. five to 650 range, somewhere in there. Yeah, and that's a lot. I mean, if you think that each tape is 30 minutes long, I mean, that's, that's and in your hands for hours with all the preparation, you got a lot of hands on, you know, time. Um, and it's the coolest job in the world because I get to hear people's drum sounds from the seventies. I get to hear people's drum sounds from the sixties. I get to hear what an electric guitar sound from the nineties recorded in Seattle sounded like it's an, it, as an engineer for me, the most exciting part is getting to hear what other engineers were doing at different times. It's like a history lesson. It's great. It really, it really is. Yeah. And we'll get onto that too. Cause this is where you and I geek out all the time on transfers. Yeah. But we got a couple more questions, which is awesome. Sure. Keep the questions coming. So would the same techniques apply uh, for old four track cassette tapes? Um, probably not. Um, but because we don't, we can't go 
we can't uh, a cassette requires us to use the mechanism of the of the machine but uh and they and they didn't get into high output tapes very often they they, they stuck with different tape formulations um so yes and no e everything's a different approach you when know? i was um at aes this last year i went and watched a panel all about archiving tapes from the 90s and uh I believe it was Eddie Sledi, great Eddie Sledi, who said um, that he bakes everything. He bakes dats. He bakes all tapes, cassettes. He bakes them all, but it's usually not necessary. Yeah, and and that's a great question too. Phil's got a great question. We'll get to in a second, but you know, do you just bake every tape? No. Yeah. Um, and why? Sorry. And why not? Which which tapes don't you bake? Uh, you never bake an acetate tape. Don't do that. It will bind and bond in a way that it will you will ruin the tape. So okay. there are certain formulations of tape from certain eras that you just can't bake. You will ruin it. So knowing what tapes to bake and how long to bake them can be the difference between something I can work with and something I can't work with. And that's part of why I don't. When we get transfer clients, a lot of times they'll say, I can bake it, I can bake it. And that's great if you can, but just let us handle it. We, we will handle it. It's included in the price. It's going to cost the same either way. And um, mm -hmm. also that way, I it, it's better for me, I find. It's better for me because then I know how long it was baked. I know what temperature it was baked at. Um, I did a transfer last week um, where the client had baked it and sent it to us. And it transferred fine. It was 456. But at the end of the transfer, I did see a little bit of oxide on my dancer arm and stuff. And the transfer came out fine, it came out smooth, but I would have, I, if I had baked it, I would have known how long I had baked it and I would have just felt a little more at ease because I know where I'm at as opposed to. And we've got the proper equipment too, like like a, a household oven doesn't go low enough. Absolutely, not, not even close. And it's not the correct type of convection type, you know. Um, so I'm, I'm going to plow through some more questions here. Andrew wanted to know, is the tape evaluation that we're talking about visual? It's, it's everything, you know, um, it, you know, we, I'm going to find some photos, you know, we, that I have on cue, you know, we, we look at the tapes themselves and the documentation and say, well, now this is correct, right? That's an eight track track sheet with a one inch pancake of a tape that was made in the seventies when that format was correct. Right. Yeah. And you were mentioning about a 16 track transfer that, and I remember I was talking about it, the tapes came with a 24 track track sheet, but actually it was two inch 16. Yeah. So you know, luckily we've got all the machines. So you, with your knowledge said, this doesn't sound right. I've got things on different tracks, moved over to a different machine, transfer to go, this is right. Email the client. Hey, just so you know what you've got is this and off we go. Yep. So, um, yeah, you start to notice certain tracks are summed together, or tracks yeah. aren't lining up with their track sheet. If it's a, if it's a sixteen, but they say it's a twenty-four, what is supposed to be your snare drum might be your hi hat and rack tom. You know, it, just, it kind of shifts over every few tracks, and stuff gets summed, and it's it's weird. <laughs> well, and it's a lot like you know, like Andrew asked. You know, it's a lot like hearing someone sing and knowing what microphone you want to use. Mm -hmm. You know, you look at a tape and you go, okay, this is going to require this. And this yeah. is the considerations I need to have with this reel of tape. And that picture I showed a minute ago with those five reels of tape, that was one project. Mm -hmm. Or one client bought those five reels of tape and they were all different. Oh, that's super so, common to get a bunch of different formulations. And yeah. again, the documentation can be, the documentation is great to have. If you have documentation, always include it with the transfer. But just because... I have documentation that says one thing doesn't mean that I'm necessarily a thousand percent sold on it. Um, a yeah. lot of times the documentation at some point along the way gets switched up with a different tape box or I don't know, they didn't overdub and forgot to write down a track that they were doing on their thing and moving quick. I don't know. So it's nice to have, but it's not gospel truth. Well, we see it all the time when people drop tapes off, they open up all the boxes. And they start talking. We're like, no, 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 close those back up. Let's look at one at a time. Yeah, yeah. It can get mixed around. And and it's important to note too when we get a transfer, and if there's nothing documented on track one, for instance, 
we still make an audio one and record it. And I would say at least half the time, something shows up on there. You something. know? Yeah. Something. Even if it's you just know, Android Studio, it's really cool stuff. Yeah. So here's a question from Phil. He wants to know, do we deal with alignment, bias, calibration, test tones? Um, well, bias, we don't deal with because that's on the recording side. That's already taken care of, even though we know how to do it. Um, and um, Jeremy, if there's tones, what do you do? If there's not tones, what do you do? How do you handle those two, two scenarios? So our goal is to transfer. Our goal of the transfer is to make it sound exactly as best as we can, as close to it did the day it was recorded. That's the ideal goal that we're shooting for. If there are tones printed, which I would say maybe a third of them have tones printed, um, we'll align to your tones. We'll align 1K, 10K, and 100. We'll, yeah, we'll align for level, high frequency, low frequency, and um, we'll do the transfer to your tones because your engineer had the foresight knowing that, knowing that it was one day going to be transferred to digital. No, but um, we'll try it. We'll do that. Otherwise, for the other two thirds of transfers or so, what I'll do is I'll throw an MRL up and I'll just align it flat. And this is where Chris has taught me a ton just about the history of tape. And if I'm dealing with 456 from the 80s, it's probably this level. And this is a safe level to assume if it's, if it's recorded in 1995, it's going to be elevated. If it's recorded in 1970, probably not going to be elevated. So there's kind of a history um, of recording element that Chris has shared with me that is really helpful for knowing. So part of tape evaluation is looking at the date, looking at the formulation. Was it recorded at a pro studio? It's, some of it's a history just looking at what I'm being given. Yeah. And, and the, the underlying thing, just a little background for Phil's question is, um, you know, on on bigger projects, not pro studio or not pro, but just typically bigger projects, they allow the time, I'll say this, for the engineer to prepare and, and calibrate the machine and then record their calibration tones onto the tape that will, that will travel with the tape forever, right? Yep. And that allows us to calibrate our machine as that engineer did back in 1982 or whatever. If those weren't done, which isn't a fault of anyone, right? A lot of times you just have to record 10 songs a day back in the eighties. We set our machine up to be flat and transfer it that way. That way you're getting an accurate um, reproduce anyway, right? Um, Joshua had an interesting question. He wants to know about insurance or guarantees. You mentioned the form earlier. Jeremy, uh, like a, can you talk about that and what, sure. what we, what we can do there? Yeah. So before we start any transfer project, we'll send you um, a analog transfer release form. And the main gist of that is that hey, we're working with a physical piece of tape that's might be decades old, might be from the, as old as the '40s or '50s, depending on what you're sending us. And we're taking it this piece of tape is out of history. It's had its own life. Let's say it was recorded in 1970. It was recorded on. Since it was recorded on, it's had decades of history of moving around the country, maybe, or being stored in I don't know, the trunk of someone's car or an attic, or we don't know where the tape has been, how it's been stored. So the form, a lot of the gist of the form is saying that we are going to work on your piece of tape. You give us that right. And that we're not, held accountable, if anything, if it's not a successful transfer, because we're not responsible for how it's been stored. And if it's been stored properly versus being stored improperly, could be the difference, is going to relate heavily to how much I can do. I, I can't, I can't um, undo real damage. If the tape has severe water damage, or I've seen a few tapes that have mold caked, and, mold caked onto the actual tape itself i that's not a typical transfer thing that i can really do i can't i can't take away the water damage that happened 20 years ago when there was a flood yeah yeah so basically our agreement says hey look you know no one can predict how these old tapes are going to be uh, how they're going to handle this process but we're going to take every precaution to make sure it's successful um because we care about it you know um and don't sue us <laughs> so uh, Johnny's got a great question about the paper leader. 
um, between songs, are they baked as is, or do you need to remove it? Um, so for both the paper or the plastic leader, um, I much prefer the plastic leader for transfers. Um, so the paper leader will shred sometimes, just being old paper leader, especially the quarter inch stuff. Um, it is fine to be baked. It's not going to combust or anything. Um, we're not baking at a high enough temperature to damage the leader. I've never had an issue um, with leader damage or anything like that. And sometimes, I guess when we're doing our evaluation or our transfer, it does happen. Sometimes after baking, the adhesive moisture gets pulled out on the tape, the edit tape. And so sometimes we will have uh, the tape edits break whether it's a, between two pieces of recording tape or a piece of tape and a leader, sometimes that will break the actual tape will just kind of, the edit will break. So we'll redo your edit, we'll retape that and get it right if that does happen. It's somewhat common. And, and we debated this too, we're not sure if it was this time that did that, you know, or or the baking, but either way, the, the paper leader will often break and we'll just take it out as we transfer. Um, and it's between songs, so there's no damage. We'd stop the machine anyway and make a new Pro Tools session. So, um, and I uh, feel like, oh, go ahead, go ahead. That with digital technology, the state that it's at, with great converters and great software, if there was a musical edit that were to break between two pieces of recorded tape, it's not ideal. But unlike something shedding where I'm losing it forever, if that does happen, I can really quickly fix the edit with a piece of edit tape, rewind 15 seconds, record it, and make the edit happen digitally if I need to. Mm -hmm. And that has had to happen sometimes. And that's, in my experience, sometimes the better option as to rewinding to the top of the song and transferring it again. I'll usually yeah. do that just to be safe so I can cover my bacon no matter what. but a lot of times I'll find that doing the edit digitally at that point is actually um, a better result. Yeah. It's so, a, it hasn't gone over the transfer twice then, you know? Yeah. And I'll jump on this one. So yeah. Tara wants to know if we detect azimuth before digitation, if so, how? So it, the, the word of the question is if, if a tape has those tones on there, um, you can sort out whether the original machine's heads were perfectly um, perpendicular to the tape or if they're slightly skewed. So um, on tapes without tone, uh, if it's a multi-track tape, you just can't really accurately do that. You could move the head around, but you can't really tell. If a multi-track tape has tones and they're stable enough to do an accurate azimuth change, we will do that. And that's where skills from Mara machines really play in because we do azimuth adjustments all the time in Mara machines. Uh, and in lacquer cutting, you know, um, and if it's a two track, like a stereo tape, we can do azimuth with or without tones, obviously easier with tones. And we've got two or three different ways we do it um, to get the transfer to sound like it was on the original machine. So, yeah. Um, another question. This one's for, oh, I'll get this one real quick. Phyllis wants to know um, if this will be available on replay. Yes, it'll be on our Facebook page under videos as well as all the Q&A in quarantine. So just watch them at your leisure. They're all about an hour long and we do them just like this. Uh, here's one for you, Jeremy. Chris wants to know if we apply any processing while transferring, compression, Q, or et cetera. Nope, typically we don't. Um, the process is really just get the tape in the best shape that we can, align your tones, or if there are no tones, just keep it flat and then uh, go from tape machine output into digital converter and just straight in. Yeah. We've, got a, we've got a six foot chunk of Megami wire. Here's a picture from our machine to our converters. Uh, here's another, I'm sorry I'm having three So, oops. Um, and we're using uh, Lynx Aurora converters, which sound fantastic, very true, clean, which is what you want for a transfer, so. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and hold on. I'm looking. Okay. So Josh wants to know if we do cassette tapes. Yes, we do. Yep. Yep. And we have software to clean up things. So we we do a lot of transfers where most people 
have DAWs now. So we'll do the transfer because we have the machines. And like Josh, if you had if you had your own software to clean up the stuff and, and do the noise reduction and make it sound better, have at it. If, if you don't have that stuff, we can talk to you about an hourly rate to clean it up or a bulk rate to clean up and make it sound better. And then we can even master it. It just depends. So we can we can take it as far as you want to go. But most of the time we're we're involved to get the for expertise on getting things off tape into Pro Tool or into a DAW. So um, let's talk a little bit and any more questions, just throw them at us. But uh, you know, let's talk about some of our favorite projects. Sure. Jeremy, uh, you talked about how it's how fun it is to hear different stuff. And I know you and I kind of geek out over track sheets a lot. And I'm like, oh man, this is a eight track transfer and the engineer called the kick drum a foot. So this is gonna be awesome, you know? And 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 I've learned a lot of of things um, from doing transfers because we get to reverse engineer, so to speak. Um, what are some of your favorite projects? So as far as ones that I've done, um, I think the cool, uh, for me, the one that really got me the most excited when I was doing it was a Johnny Cash transfer. That was, it got the hair on my arm sticking up, my goosebumps. I, it freaked me out hearing, pressing play on a tape machine and hearing Johnny Cash's voice come out of speakers in front of me. It was a pretty surreal moment. Um, but also, um, not too long ago, I got to do a transfer where one of my heroes, um, Eric Clapton, was playing guitar in the band. And that was another surreal moment for me. Um, when I, that's that's one where I was really glad the documentation was there because I don't know if I, I would have known if it didn't say Clapton guitar on track seven or whatever. I was like, yeah. yeah. And we're nerds. And you called me on like a Saturday, like, dude, you're not going to believe this. And I lost my shit. So uh, what what else have you done that, that you can talk about? Um, done Toadies, 90s band. Um, done Slaughter. Um, awesome. Yeah. Yeah, those are some ones I've been Pat Boone. Yeah. Yeah. And you talked you talked about uh, some Johnny Cash stuff, some of the, my favorite ones. We've done some work. We've done a bunch of work for the uh, Carter Cash family. And we also are heavily involved in vinyl manufacturing on electric plating. And they brought us some old uh, vinyl stampers from the 50s, and we were able to um, – make modern stampers so they could get test pressings done and hear what they actually had because you can't listen to a stamper. So that's kind of where the whole, all of our businesses can jump in on these. Um, I've had the pleasure of transferring Paul McCartney stuff, which is really cool with the engineer that recorded it, uh, Ernie Winfrey. So it was really fun hearing Paul and Linda in the same booth talking about stuff between takes. Um, what else? Uh, we did a whole bunch of work for for the Chuck Berry family, who are awesome, you know. Um, you know, um, what else? Um, can you, yeah. <laughs> um, what else have we done? I'm looking at my list here. Oh, you know, and, and those are big clients, right? Big names and stuff. But man, we did one, I think in the summer, a uh, family, it was an heirloom project that we talked about, and they brought a little vinyl record. Remember this, Jeremy? Yeah. Um, and, and it was, we showed the letters from home earlier on cassette, on tape, and this was a record booth, and you could go in there. Jack White has made this famous, but they were, they were everywhere for years, and you could walk in and for a couple of bucks, you know, record a minute or two of you talking and then mail it home. And this one was a family brought it in and it was, t tell us the story, Jeremy, it was pretty cool. Yeah, so this was um, when, it was a World War II record, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think it was their great uncle or their great grandfather had um, walked and recorded this little, small, short little record. And basically it was really heartbreaking, but basically the gist of it was They've given us the maps and taught us how to read the maps, but they haven't told us what to do when we get there. And about a month later, a few weeks later, their great uncle died in war. Um, I think it was maybe in Austria, Chris? 
Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. And so when we were listening to that in the room, that got really heavy really fast and everyone was really um, heartbroken hearing this, but it was such a special moment just getting to hear that and really getting to preserve this moment of their family and heritage and history. Yeah, because, you know, that one is as important as any other transfer we do because there isn't a copy of it on Spotify. It hasn't been released. This is the only thing the family has of their great grandfather. And I'm not going to lie, man. There wasn't, it was me and you and, and two grandkids in there in the control room. And there wasn't a dry eye in there. Yeah. That was a really special, heavy, um, heavy archival work that we did. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, I I remember remember it was all wonky. That, that little record was all wonky and you rigged together, you taped a few razor blades together to weigh down yeah. the, the stylus. Yep. Yeah, and again, we had the correct record player from that era to play it on, you know, because yeah, yeah, yeah. you can play it on a new one. Uh, this is Christy Winfrey. She's Ernie's daughter. Uh, Ernie was the engineer of the McCartney Wing stuff. Very um, cool. He was such a great guy, you know. Um, let's look back through some photos. Uh, Johnny once says that our two-inch machine looks like an MCI. Yes, yeah. it does. Uh, Mar Machines, which we've referenced a few times, um, is the world's largest um, analog tape machine restoration company, and we we focus on MCI machines. So we know machines uh, inside and out, um, and they're all MCIs. So Jamie wants to know, and thanks for the question. This is awesome. Um, Jamie wants to know: Is there a converter interface with twenty-four inputs and outputs? Do you mean like available? Um, Commercially, like you can buy. Uh, yeah, there's a bunch of them now. Yeah, we use two Aurora 16s linked together for 32 IO um, for recording sessions, but that way we can do um, 24, and then we can also do a rough mix uh, as we go down. A lot of people ask for that too. Um, Danny wants to know how do you ensure clients with no additional copies will exist? Oh. Um, you know, that is part of our, um, um, paperwork. Yeah. We, we delete off of our hard drives. Everyone in the building knows we do transfers. Jeremy keeps our, our transfer hard drives in a separate room. And, and we work with, you know, we're recording studios. So we work with high end clients working on unreleased material too. So that, that, um, trust is held pretty sacred with us from a fundamental standpoint and in our vinyl manufacturing, we work on stuff that is secret records all the time. So, um, and that's another thing too, you know, we're, we're having to pause a lot to think about what we can talk about because we sign NDAs on almost everything we work on. And that's a non-disclosure agreement. And um, another thing I'll say is that it, it really depends on the project also. I mean, if you're coming to us with sensitive, particularly sensitive tapes or tapes that, people would be interested in something, a high profile artist, a classic artist. A lot of times it depends on the project because they may come to us with, a, with two drives and say, at the end of your day, back this up. Or we'll talk to them and say, is this something you want us to back up onto one of our drives? Or is this something that you just want one copy of on your drive and that's it? Most clients want something backed up, whether that means they have two drives that they provide to us or that they get from us or whether that's their drive and then we hold on to a backup. It really depends, but we'll cater to your needs. I mean, if, if you if it's really important that there's no backups or that you have all the backups, power to you, we're happy to do that. But it's a discussion that we'll have a lot of times if it's a high profile client or a bulk transfer. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, the rule rule of thumb is we don't, you know, we don't blab about it unless we ask. So, and, and I had emailed, um, um, Charlie Barry Chuck's son, um, a couple weeks ago in advance of this, asking if I could talk about that transfer in specific, because at the time we had an NDA. Um, so, but, um, but yeah, Janine, please, if, if it's something we can do with, let us know, we'd love, we'd love to do any foundation work. Um, and that's also a pleasure of ours with Mar machines. We've sold a lot of machines to archive um, places, you know, 
uh, we just dropped one off in New Orleans uh, a couple months ago um, for the for the Jazz Foundation there, you know, and and we help get get them up to speed on tape transfers too. So um, it's just a big part of our DNA. Um, Phil Blackman, hey Phil, um, he it's a pretty long question. Let's see. Uh, and to fill it, Arcus with that's curious Arco closet difference in digital analog tape formats. Uh, he wants to know if there's a difference in the digital versus analog formats. You know, we don't have any real to real digital machines, and I, I'm not an expert on that. Um, I do a lot of debt transfers, and we have a procedure for that. We don't bake them, but yeah, but um, the Biggest thing for me I've seen with DAT transfers, and we've got one coming in, where they try to transfer it and the tape broke. Yeah. Most of the time it's a DAT machine that breaks. So we we use a, we have a sacrificial DAT, we call it, that doesn't mean anything to anybody. And even though we use our DAT machine every month, we pop that in there, press play, fast forward, rewind, make sure the DAT machine hasn't had a malfunction. And then we put the DAT in there and, and up to the races, so. Um, I'd say it's a pretty, pretty similar process, just yeah. minus, minus the baking, and there's less to evaluate. I can't really evaluate much from a dad. Yeah. So, and, and, you know, I'm very cautious about what I say until I've done enough to say, here's how we handle this. You know, I haven't been, I wouldn't have done this Q&A 10 years ago. I was still learning a lot about tapes. And we, st and we learn every day. Seriously, there's, there's new things that pop up. Um, all the time, so it's fun. Um, I'm trying to think. So, so Jeremy, we kind of wrap it up in an hour. So, how you know, I've seen a lot of questions about people that have stuff. How do they get started with us? Um, I, there's been a lot of questions, kind of about trust too. I can see some trust questions. You know, uh, you know. So they email you at transfers at welcome 1979. What do they need from from us? What do we need from them? What do they get at the end? So the way the process typically works is you can email me at transfers at welcome to 1979.com. It's transfers with an S at the end. And um, basically, I'll just ask some very basic info, how many reels of tape, and I'll send back the transfer um, release form, which you can print up, sign, fill out. Um, and you can just include that with your tapes if you want, or sometimes people will scan it and send it back to me. Um, but then you ship your tapes. Normally, you ship your tapes to the studio. Um, right now, in the age of coronavirus, we're um, still able to work on transfers, but we're shipping the tapes direct to me. So um, let me know before you ship them if you're going to do this soon. But um, typically, you just ship your tapes to the studio. And um, basically, when we're done with the project, after we've transferred, we'll invoice you through an email because a lot of times people will say, oh, it's, it's three songs. This, this reel is three songs, but it might have five songs on it. It might have two songs on it. I mean, mm -hmm. so again, the documentation can be misleading. So we'll invoice you at the end of a project, typically. Um, and then once you pay it, we'll send you back your tapes. And uh, there's usually a, a hard drive add-on. Um, so it's a $25 add-on with a 32 gigabyte thumb drive. Or if necessary, a lot of the multi-track transfers, especially if it's a 96K24 transfer, will end up on a 250 gigabyte drive, which is a $50 add-on. Yeah, and then after they get their drive and their tapes, we say, hey, once you get that loaded in your computer and everything looks good, we'll delete it off our hard drive. So there's never, everything isn't traveling together at once. And so. for things that we are backing up internally, which is most projects. I 90% of the projects we do, we back up internally. It's really just those few um, sensitive projects that they ask us, hey, or they give us multiple drives to say, hey, we really just can't get out. So on those ones, we don't back it up. But from 90% of the projects, we are internally backing up and we'll hold on to it, I'd say, for a few months. Typically, yeah. if we haven't heard from you in a few months, you should backed up your work. We recommend, I recommend everyone backs up, but when I send them off a transfer, I always recommend back up your work, back up this, these files immediately, because that's the huge advantage. One of the huge advantages of digitizing your files and archiving them is that 
it takes five minutes to back up two gigabytes. Yep. It took me hours to do this transfer plus hours of bacon. Yeah. Well, you, you made a good point that you're still able to transfer, even though the studio is shut down right now. Um, you're able to do prep work and you've got a couple, you brought a couple machines to your house, which yep. is great. So if you are, if you have downtime and you are looking at tapes that you haven't, you know, it's been on your studio list forever and ever. Now's the time. Hit us up. Um, at least get the process started. Um, and we're going to end on one other question. Let's see. had something to say, Jeremy. Oh, uh, something really quick. I mean, yeah. it's not to be sensational about it or anything, but your tapes, it's a matter of when they're going to start to degrade yeah. and fail. It's not a matter of if. Everything tangible comes to an end. We all die. Tapes eventually wear out or fall apart. Um, so there's no advantage to waiting. Digital conversion is so good. Converters have gotten so good. And I don't see any reason why I would wait to do a transfer when water damage could happen or the tape could just start to fall apart. There's no reason to wait at this point. I would say it's time to digitize it. Yeah. And we haven't changed our rates. We keep, we keep them really affordable so we can do stuff. And we do have bulk pricing that we talked about. Uh, one last question and we'll sign off. Uh, thanks again, for everyone, for the questions. It's been really fun. I love it when time flies. Uh, Janine just wanted to know, this is a great question, um, what's recommended storage for tapes baked and not? Um, you know, tapes are like people. They want to be in, in a cool, dry climate. You know, don't put them in your attic where you wouldn't want to be. Put them, put them where you are. Um, you know, where you put books and all that kind of stuff and upright. And uh, like we talked about before, don't open up all the reels at once when family members come over and get nostalgic because that's when um, reels get put in the wrong boxes and all that. And and we have to decipher that stuff later. So, Tell that. Tales. So any questions, uh, email uh, Jeremy at transfers at welcome1979.com and we'll get started on your project or just answer some questions. You know, so thank you very much. Everyone stay safe and have a good time. Bye.